explore these concepts, Lord, that you have brought to us. Lord, it assures us that you want us to reach into the fullness of Christ, Lord. I pray, Lord, that the words that will go forth will edify me and edify the rest of the body. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. Thank you for the words that you will give to your people this morning. I pray that good seeds will be sown, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Alright, so last time I was up here, I told myself that it won't happen again for the next 10 years. I told others as well. <laughs> but here I am, less than three months after. But nevertheless, it's a privilege, even with the inadequacy, it's a privilege to be able to present to the body of Christ on such important concepts. So, so far in the series, Show the Body to the Body, we have looked at length and in depth into comparisons between the, phys the mystical body of Christ and the physical body. We also looked at unity in diversity, the head of the body being Christ, and how each one of us within the mystical body, much like the physical body, are necessary for the existence and functionality of the whole body. Today, I would like to focus more on the growth of the body and how each one of us plays a necessary part in fostering healthy growth in the body of Christ and how being connected to a healthy, growing body results in personal growth and maturity in Christ. So let's turn our attention now to the scripture in focus this morning, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 16. And he gave some apostles and some prophets, some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the, unto the edifying of itself in love. So let us backtrack a little. In the first half of the Apostles Paul's letter to the Ephesians, as seen in chapters 1 to 3, he details the beautiful mystery of the gospel. He describes how God made us holy and without blame in his eyes, in love, and how he, God, decided to adopt us as his own and reconciled us unto himself through Jesus Christ. We learn that through his mercy, he forgave our sins and gave us life as we were also raised up when Christ was risen from the dead. Paul called this the mystery of his will, according to Ephesians 1 verse 9. God's mysterious will as it pertains to Christ was not yet revealed up until this time. Through the crucified body of Christ, we are gifted with peace and hope, which was before non-existent because of the enmity between God's chosen people, the Jews, and us Gentiles, as well as the enmity between us and God because of Adam's sin. Through Christ, the two groups are made to be at peace with each other, and now 
both as one body are reconciled to God, as is found in Ephesians 2, 15 to 16. So now Gentiles like myself, who were once afar off, are made nigh and now identified as his own. And all this he did for his good pleasure, because it pleased him. So after detailing this most precious revelation to the Ephesians, Paul starts off chapter 4 with this. He says, starting from verse 1, Therefore, which is connecting what he has already said to what he's about to say, I, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the vocation or calling wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another, one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. In other words, since you were once alienated and are now called, I urge you to walk worthy. Worthy here in the Greek is axios, which also means fitting, matching. So I urge you to walk worthy or fitting of this calling or this invitation you have received to be one with God. Be humble. Be gentle, be patient with one another, be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The word endeavor, as is used here in verse 3, denotes an object to be carefully and earnestly watched for and promoted. So in other words, we should make every attempt to keep each other united in the spirit and to be bound up in peace we must therefore at all times reject even the slightest trace of anything contrary to the unity of the spirit for there is one lord one faith one baptism one god and father of all who is above all in and through all so in essence Paul is challenging the Ephesians to respond to the gospel which he had just outlined in the previous chapters. And now he's saying, hey, this is how you walk out this thing in your daily lives. And today I believe that it is a challenge to us also as we are covenant members that we too must be humble, must be gentle, must be patient with one another, pouring out ourselves for one another, and earnestly fostering unity and peace within the body. Walking in this manner is not a matter of civic duty or church duty. It should be our response to the precious gospel of Christ through which we have been called. Perhaps, the reason we are often unkind to each other, impatient with one another, and striving against each other is because we don't carry the weight of this precious gospel in our hearts at all times. A mature church that measures up to the full and complete standard of Christ must be unified, first of all, in the faith and knowledge of Christ. In verse 11 it says, And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. Verse 12 goes on to say, For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, the English Standard Version puts it this way. 
to equip the saints for the work of the ministry and for the building up of the body of Christ. But to what end? Well, let's look at verse 13. It says, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. So, he gave these giftings for one, the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. Here, perfecting comes from the Greek, katartizo, which also means bringing to a condition of fitness. So the apostles, the prophets, the teachers are given to us to equip the members to do the work of the ministry. So we should all be doing something for the work of the ministry not just the apostles, the prophets, or the teachers, but all of us are equipped to do the work of the ministry. Number two, they are given to us so that for the edifying of the body of Christ, or in other words, for the building up of the body. And this should be done until we all, not some, come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of Christ. It's interesting to me how Paul doesn't say until the church becomes international or reaching the multitudes of the world or bursting as it seemed with members. With members. He says we should continue to be built up to the end that all of us come into the unity of the faith and knowledge of Christ. It sounds simple, but yet so profound. One of the main goals of these gifts working in our midst is to ensure that we are all of one in faith and knowledge of Christ. It is only on that basis that we will secure corporate maturity and unity. When the dust settles, what do we believe as members? Where does our faith lie? As a matter of fact, to be more specific, what do we believe about the Son of God as members of the church? I am convinced that this is the most critical indicator of our maturity as a body. The scripture says, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of Christ, unto a perfect or mature or complete man in Christ, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. We will mature and measure up to the standard of God when we all come into the unity of the faith and knowledge of Christ. Not if we all look or sound alike, but if we all believe and are unified by one faith in Christ. In fact, this is what separates us from all other corporate bodies. It's Jesus. It's the gospel of Jesus. Even if on the surface we seem to get along, if we are not unified in faith and knowledge of Christ, the growth and maturity of the body will be hindered. Verse 14. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. As Sister Rachel and Brother Robert alluded to in previous messages, it is possible for us to be as children in our understanding instead of being mature in Christ. The Apostle Paul makes a direct connection between being unstable in doctrine and being a child. Much of the difference between the behavior of a child versus a healthy, fully grown adult is a lack of maturation of the frontal lobe of the brain in children. The prefrontal cortex, which is at the very front of the brain, coordinates higher order cognitive processes and executive functioning. Executing, executive functions are a set of supervisory cognitive skills needed for goal-directed behavior, 
including planning, response inhibition, working memory and attention. These skills allow an individual to pause long enough to take a stock of a situation, assess his or her options, and plan a course of action and execute it. Poor executive functioning leads to difficulty with planning, attention, using feedback, and mental inflexibility, all of which could undermine judgment and decision making. Studies suggest that the neural connections, that is the connections in the brain between the amygdala, which is a structure in the brain involved in emotional processing, especially those of fear and vigilance, and the cortices that comprise the front of the brain, this area which helps in executive functioning become denser during adolescence. These connections are vital as they integrate both the emotional and cognitive processes and result in what is often considered to be emotional maturity. That is the ability to regulate and to interpret emotions. So therefore, when a child is born, that child cannot help but act like a child because their brain function has to be built up over time for them to come into higher executive functioning and emotional maturity. It is through physical and chronological maturation that this process of brain development occurs to hopefully result in maturity. Similarly, a believer has to be built up within the body to that point of maturity. The scripture says, then, after being built up, then we will no longer be like children. That is, after we have come to the unity in faith and knowledge of Christ, then we will no longer exhibit childlike behavior. This childlike attitude should not be confused with a childlike faith that Jesus speaks of in Matthew, th Matthew 18 verse 3 as an attribute of the believer, but more of an infancy in Christ as seen in 1 Corinthians 3 verses 1 to 3. In 1 Corinthians 3, Verses 1 to 3, reading from the King James Version, it says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye are not able to bear it, neither yet know are ye able, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying, and strife, and divisions, are ye not carnal and walking as men? This infancy characterizes the ability to handle the strong meat of the word and only being able to feed on milk. It also characterizes a worldliness that may cause the infant believer to resemble someone who is not saved and the inability to consider delayed gratification rather than instant satisfaction of the flesh. This results in the, in the believer being tossed to and fro, or in other words, being carried about by unsound teaching. The believer becomes susceptible to the agenda of deceptive men who spread a false wisdom which is unbiblical. The gravity of such a possibility is too great to be taken lightly. However, we are not left in the dark as to what this growing up looks like for believers. We are encouraged in verse 15 that instead, instead of being like infants, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every, in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. John Newton is best known for his classic hymn, Amazing Grace, but he also wrote much more. One of the most helpful things he ever wrote is found among with his collected letters where a fellow minister had written to Newton informing him of his intention to write an article criticizing another minister because of a disagreement about some point of theological controversy, something that we know happens quite often. Newton's reply to this minister 
should be a required reading for all who engage in theological writing or discussion, whether in books, journals, blogs, or back porches. The following is a quote from Newton's reply. If you account him a believer, though greatly mistaken in the subject of debate between you, the words of David to Job concerning Absalom are very applicable. Deal gently with him for my sake. The Lord loves him and bears with him. Therefore, you must not despise him or treat him harshly. The Lord bears with you likewise and expects that you should show tenderness to others from a sense of the much forgiveness you need yourself. In a little while, you will meet in heaven. He will then be dearer to you than the nearest friend you have upon this earth now. Anticipate that period in your thoughts, and though you may, not, and though you may find it necessary to oppose, to oppose his errors, view him personally as a kindred soul with whom you are to be happy in Christ forever. How does speaking the truth in love result in growth? The truth and love are inseparable here. How many times have we seen a heated discussion between two believers, especially these days on social media, where the truth is being conveyed by one party, but there is no love in it and simply results in unfruitful exchange of words? The growth of the entire body will come with, with the communication of the truth of the word of God in love. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. John 13, 34 to 35. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. 1 John 4, verse 7. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. 1 John 3, verse 14. Now, finally, each part has to do its special work in order that the whole body might grow healthily. Ephesians 4, 16, ESV version reads, From whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. As each part of the body is working, it fosters growth in the surrounding areas. As the cells in the physical body multiply from each other and perpetuate themselves, each member of the body is responsible to foster growth in the other parts of the body. The body edifies itself. Not only that, but every part of the body has to be connected to another part of the body in order to growth. Standalone or isolated, there will be no nourishment or any available pathway to receive growth signals for any parts of the body. This will only result in atrophy of that part of the body and eventual death of that part of the body. We all have to be connected first to the source and then to each other, working together and believing together for the growth and maturity to take place. We must also bear in mind that even though the whole body grows together, the different parts grow at different rates. Similarly, members of the body of Christ. Imagine if our fingers were to grow as fast as our legs, or if our tongues were to grow as fast as our chest. The body would be as handicapped and deformed as it looks and lack in proper functioning. Yes, iron sharpeneth iron, 
but there has to be contact between the two and strenuous and uncomfortable contact at that. The pulpit ministry is critical, but after the word is preached, it is a responsibility of members of the body to carry out the work of the ministry that they have been built up for. Perhaps we may consider that a church that has grown up properly is not deformed and doesn't have factions or divisions or cliques. A church that has grown up has an impact on its environment, both here on earth and in the heavenly realms. As it says in Ephesians 3.10, can you imagine that the church here on earth is used to display God's wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places? So it's not only about what happens here on earth, but God uses us as the church to show his wisdom to even heavenly principalities. A church that has grown up is able to appreciate, chew, and digest strong meat without being hurt by it. A church that has grown up is fully aware of their identity, which family they belong to, and how they should conduct themselves. A church that is grown up understands that church is much more than what happens on the stage once or twice per week and thus acts accordingly. And finally, again, a church that, is, that has grown up is unified firstly and most importantly in their faith and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, speaking the truth in love at all times. Amen.